All right, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thanks for asking me to provide an update on the FAA's Weather Community of Interest, or COI. And I want to thank uh, my co-chair, Alfred Musikanian, and also uh, the rest of our core team, which is Matt Franzak and uh, Dave Strand, uh, who some of you may have heard of. So a lot of you have seen this uh, Weather COI uh, presentation before. So I just have a few slides to review for those that may not have seen it or just need a little bit of a refresher. And I'll tell you what we've been doing uh, since our last uh, FPAL meeting. So the way we started things out is looking at the challenge. Within most organizations, we have silos of excellence where you've got different groups within your organization working on something that may have commonality, but they're not talking to each other. And certainly the FAA is uh, one of those organizations like many others. So we look at the different parts of the FAA that are producing, researching weather, consuming weather information, doing great jobs at it, but geez, for some reason we just don't talk to each other. So how do we do that? Next slide, please. We develop a community of interest. And really the whole idea of the community of interest is communication. That is really the key word here, to make sure that those silos of excellence are talking to each other, sharing ideas, sharing information, or as our administrator says, sharing data. So we wanted to make sure that all those different parts of the FAA that were working weather were actually talking to each other and looking at the problems that we have. What do we have in common? What problems didn't we know about that somebody else was working with that we might be able to help each other with? And that's the whole idea of a community of interest. Next slide, please. So a community of interest in the FAA is a formal organization. It's actually chartered chartered under the Enterprise Architecture Board and our senior leadership is our steering committee. So they guide the work that a COI does. Each COI has an executive sponsor. In this case, it's my boss, our director of the Portfolio Management and Technology Development Office, Paul Fontaine. And then typically a COI would have a chair or co-chairs. And some of this is free flowing. There's only a couple of COIs in the FAA and they all work a little bit differently. For whatever reason, we decided we'll have a couple of co-chairs, myself and Alfred, so we've really got the research side of FAA being next gen where I work, and then the operations side where Alfred works in the program management organization. And I must say we get great support from our secretariat, uh, Dave Strand and Matt Franzak doing a great job for us. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna recap the activities that occurred for the COI up to the fall 2020 FPAW. Uh, back in March of 2020, we began our weekly core meetings. And oddly enough, the first meeting with myself and Alfred and Dave and Matt took place in person in L'Enfant Plaza the day before the world ended and <laughs> pandemic hit and we shut down and never went back to work since. So we had one in-person meeting with each other and then we started doing everything virtually. And it's worked out just fine, I must say. Um, by April, we had our charter signed, continued working on our weekly core team meetings. In the May-June timeframe, we got our membership established and planned the first meeting. And I will say through April and May, we were still kind of hoping we were gonna meet in person at the MITRE facility in McLean, Virginia in July. Obviously it didn't happen. So we did everything virtually, had our first full meeting in July. We explained what the COI was in much more detail than I'm doing here. And we laid out the plans for our future meetings. The very first thing we did was to solicit problem statements from the members. And Matt, if you could go to the next slide, I just wanna show everybody the way we did that. So we prepared a form to try and give everybody some structure on what we wanted for a problem statement. All too often we find people provide a solution as their problem. And this actually isn't that easy to do unless you, you've worked at it for a while. And we even gave them a little example there of a good problem statement and a poor problem statement. And what it came down to as we were looking at these, if you would see somebody's problem statement and we could go, so what? Well, you really haven't defined your problem statement. So that's what we did here. We said, here's a so what, problem statement, 
here's a better way to define it. OK, we got it. We understand what's your issue and what's it impacting. So what we did is we had folks fill these out. We got about 37 and we went through them at the meetings. We went through every single problem statement starting in September and worked our way through adjudicating them basically into a very short elevator speech with an issue and an impact. Then we started setting up special weather action teams or SWATs. And by October, we had formed five of them to discuss the logistics, how it would work, look at more problem statements. And we also owed a briefing to the EIMSC, that's our senior leadership steering committee, about twice a year. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So um, you're going backwards, Matt. After I gave you kudos for doing such a great job, what can I say? We'll, okay. we'll, we'll, we'll talk later. All right, so what is the role of a SWAT? So all those 37 problem statements had some commonality among them. As you might guess, PIREPS. That's what really kicked off the community of interest. It's been an ATO top five for six years now, I think. So we had multiple problem statements on PIREPS. We had multiple problem statements on UAS. We had multiple problem statements on standards and policy. And we thought, how are we going to attack each one of these? We said, let's put them into groups. And that's what we did. Out of the 37 problem statements, we have nine SWATs that we're showing here on the right hand side. And these will come and go as we move into the future. We may have one that we get a solution to quickly, the SWAT disbands, and then we get new problem statements and form new SWATs or a new problem statement, say for UAS or for something else that we add into the existing SWAT. So there's no defined timeline to get to solutions. We let the SWATs work as they need to. We ask an FAA employee to volunteer to lead each SWAT, and we often have co-chairs of the SWAT. And the lead solicits volunteers from the organizations, and here's where that communication part is so important. If there's a particular issue, say within NextGen, that's got a research um, stint to it, well, maybe we want somebody from flight standards and flight safety and from PMO and from somewhere else that can help us work on that research part to get to a solution. So the, the list of bullets we have here is basically what our lead does and what the SWATs do. Next slide, please. And just to show everybody that we use a typical quad chart, we have two hour meetings about once a month with the entire team. So to make sure we try and get through an outbrief from each of the SWATs, we gave them a quad chart to fill out. And we asked them to list their problem statement, the accomplishments since the last meeting, any upcoming activities and issues they may need us to raise to senior leadership or for other parts of the entire COI to listen to and provide suggestions to. And we give them about five or six minutes to go ahead through their update um, each meeting. Next slide, please. So since the fall 2020 FPAL meeting, here's what we've done. In November, we formed three more SWATs. We briefed on the NAS weather infrastructure roadmap. So what we try and do, instead of just talking about problem statements and going through the SWAT outbriefs, is provide special briefings um, at the request of COI members or things that we think might be important and affect the COI. The SWATs that we stood up were Alaska Infrastructure Standards and Policy and Systems. By December, we formed one final SWAT of the nine we have right now, and that's specific to the San Francisco Airport Marine Stratus Forecast System. And we also had a briefing on and discussed the federal aviation weather roles and responsibilities. Three of the SWATs reported out on their activities, and that was the first time we had a full out brief on SWATs. By January, we discussed the FAA vision and weather vision for the next five, 10, 15 years of weather in the NAS. This is a big movement within the FAA and also within NextGen and then ATO. Some have called it Weather 2035, NAS Vision 2035. In any event, our administrator and senior leadership is starting to get people to look at what 20, 
2035 might look like. So we asked all of our COI members, which there are about 40, if I hadn't mentioned that before, to start thinking about what problem statements they could develop that are valid 15 years from now, not right now, but what we think we may have issues with in the future. And five more SWATs reported out on their activities in January. In February, we had made a special request to the steering committee to ask them if we could have employees from other, other federal organizations and FFRDCs join the SWATs as subject matter experts. Typically, an FAA COI is a closed organization within the FAA only. But as most of you know, with weather being cross-cutting through so many agencies within the federal government and even private industry, we asked for special permission to add our FFRDCs and actually support contractors direct to FAA. And they gave us permission to do so. Now, only the FAA employees and their support contractors are allowed at the full plenary COI meetings. But for subject matter expertise, we can now go to other federal organizations like the Weather Service, like NASA, whoever else might be working on an issue where we need that expertise, and they can join the SWATs and participate. Once that SWAT has completed its job, they're disbanded, those employees from the other organizations won't participate anymore. Also in February, seven of the SWATs reported out on their activities. And in March, we had um, a special presentation on NAS 2035. So back in January, we started talking about the idea of 2035, but in March, we were able to get our chief scientific and technical advisor for architecture and next-gen transportation, Steve Bradford, and our portfolio manager for next-gen, Diane Liang, to put together and brief the entire COI on their vision for NAS 2035 for weather. And really, most of what they talked about is an info-centric NAS which certainly has a lot to do with the UAS, ADSB, and things we've been talking about at FPAW for the past couple of days. Now, the administrator has formally uh, released the NAS Vision 2035, and we're waiting for public affairs in the FAA to release that openly on the FAA website. So it's still not formally released yet, but it's been approved so we can see what the entire vision is for the next 15 years or so. Next slide, Matt. So here's my last slide. Here's what I told you about. We have multiple organizations that interact with weather in some way, but of course we have silos of excellence. We're not necessarily talking to each other. We did that through the community of interest and we've increased our information sharing, communicate with each other and better understand what the different parts of the FAA are doing as far as weather. We've had nine successful meetings now. We've adjudicated problem statements and we have more coming. We stood up our SWATs. The SWATs are reporting out on their activities and their proposed solutions and we're moving along. Our steering committee approved that SMEs from outside the FAA can join the SWATs, which was great. We continue to solicit the, for new problem statements, form new SWATs if we need to and then look out in the future, the next 10, 15 years or so out to 2035. So Mr. Ryan, I am done. I don't know if you want to do questions now or if we're going to wait until all the uh, presentations are complete. Uh, what I'd like to do is give the other guys a chance to give their presentations and then go through the chat room for questions. Sound okay? Good by me, I will be standing by, thanks. Thank you, sir. Okay, uh, is Josh on yet? I am here, Tom. Hey, thanks, Josh. Go ahead and let us know a little bit about your uh, runway friction prediction system. I'll do that. Not necessarily a super easy title uh, of the project here, but uh, thanks, Tom. So last fall, uh, Seth Lynn and I introduced this system, which is uh, basically intended to automate what is for us currently a, a manual and subjective process used to predict and plan for runway closures during winter weather ops uh, here at the airport. 
Um, so we're here today to get you a little bit of an update on that. Um, the project did have a uh, funding cut with the onset of COVID last year. Uh, we're still in that situation, but are hopeful for things to improve here soon. Um, we also, over the past winter, were hampered in our live testing of the system due to IT issues on our end here at the airport. But uh, Seth and his team there at NCAR have been able to do some post-event analysis uh, to kind of keep us moving in the right direction here. We do remain very excited about the potential of this system and its hopes to make our, our lives easier and more importantly, to improve the safety and efficiency of, of ops here at the airport. And not just here, but eventually we hope uh, to spread it to other airports as well. So uh, we are we are hopeful that the light at the end of the COVID tunnel is coming and that funding may return soon to properly finish this project. Uh, with that, I guess uh, I'll just want to thank Seth and his team over at NCAR for all their support on this, even uh, as we've gone through this uh, period with no funding. Uh, he's uh, been great to work with, and I want to turn the mic over to him for some more detailed information and some updated case study information. So, Seth, please. Great. Um, thank you so much, Josh. I really appreciate that. Um, as Josh said, basically what I'm going to be presenting today is um, mostly verification of the runway friction closure prediction system that was running at Minneapolis International Airport over this last winter. Um, and so, um, you know, before I get to started, I just wanted to thank Josh and MSP and Mac for supporting the project um, over two years. As he said, we had two phases of the project. Um, phase two ended in April of last year, but we were running a real-time system. So with the outline in front, um, basically, I'm just going to give a, a background of what the system is. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because this is really a follow-up. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what we did in phase two. And then really, I'm just going to dive right into verification of some selected interesting cases. Um, not really in order. I kind of wanted to show sort of the state of the system during some cold storms. And we'll look at some harder cases in the fall. And then we'll talk about, you know, the goods and the bads of the system and how, how we can improve the system. So uh, next slide, please. Okay. So um, as many of you saw or may have may not seen, you know, I didn't give a bunch of slides here, but really what is the runway friction closure prediction system? Really what it is at the heart, it's a system that combines machine learning models that predict friction. So it combines machine learning models with a backend weather forecast system. And ultimately what it does is it, it uses those machine learning models and inputs from the weather forecast to predict friction values. And ultimately it combines that with rules of practice to predict runway closure alerts. And so in essence, the friction models will, you know, so the system itself right now goes from zero to six hours out at 15 minute lead times. It's updated every hour with the very latest observation data, forecast data, and it will actually update sub hourly if we have real time data from the airport. And then ultimately the friction values are combined with rules of practice and we get some closure alerts for the runway. And that's like I said, updated every hour or sub hourly. Next slide, please. So when we set up the project, um, we broke up the main MSP runways into three segments. And you can see the midpoints of those segments with the A, Bs, and Cs. So this is where we co-located our forecast locations to where MSP typically takes their friction measurements. So they do friction, fr friction runs, and then they put down a number that's associated with each of these, these segments along the runway. Next. So a real basic uh, diagram of what the real-time system does. Um, on the left side, we basically have what goes into an MDSS-like system. So this is a maintenance decision support system, which has at its core, on the left side, a cutting edge forecast engine, and that's basically die-cast. Um, that's a statistical forecast engine. And it also has a road condition and treatment module, which takes input from the weather forecast, runs a pavement model, and rules of practice related to the road, and it comes up with road conditions, or in this case, runway conditions. So that backend data is then fed into different machine learning models that predict friction based on weather conditions. And then at the same time, we're always looking for real-time data from MSP, and that will be used to forward air correct the friction data if we have it. If not, the friction data and all of the weather data, it goes through some rules of practice, and then we ultimately produce output products, and I'll show you some examples. It's really like you know, a runway closure matrix that shows friction values at each lead time plus closure alerts. And we also provide some additional forecast information such as, you know, snow rates, snow accumulation, blowing snow, um, and those types of alerts as well. Next. 
So during phase two, which, like I said, was between 2019 and ended in spring of 2020, what we wanted to do is we wanted to take the existing machine learning models and improve them by incorporating actual treatment data. And so we did this by gathering a bunch of information from MSP, um, observed friction data. We gathered observations of ROIS data um, from the airport. And then we also were able to get their treatment data as far as when they treated or plowed the runways and how that, and, and then the friction values associated with each run. We also did better forward air correction in terms of getting data from MSP in real time. We updated some of the output and we created a web display. Next. So really ultimately, um, like I said, I don't wanna to spend too much time on this, but at the end of phase two, we did a lot of investigation with different machine learning models. Some of this is laid out here. We ultimately, through verification, we determined that a combination of models using an 80% gradient boosted tree model with 20% cubist, both of these are basically like random forest regression type machine learning models, that gave us the best output. So we for every for every model that we use, we use that combination. And when I say every model, what we also determine by playing around with different experience, experiments is, is that we provide three different friction forecasts. We have a core forecast, which drives the closure alerts, which is a forecast that takes into account forecasted treatments, so it reacts to treatments. We also have a forecast that assumes um, no treatment, and that gives you the lower bound of the friction values. And we also created a model that assumes continuous treatment, which gives you the upper bound of the friction models. And I'll show you examples of these when we look at the output. Next, please. So this is just a quick example. This was from a real storm system in 2020, in February 9th, 2020, a big event that they had. This is an example of the runway closure matrix. And on the left side, the left column is all of the runway segments. So you have the four main runways with the three midpoints. The top row, the row on the top is the forecast lead time. And in the middle, we basically show what the friction values are and a color-coded runway closure potential. That could be either there's no there's going to be no closure, closures are possible in yellow, closures are likely in blue, and then closures are very likely in red. And so for this case, obviously, we were showing that there was going to be major closures with the storm. Next, please. And, and then another example of some of the plots we provide, this was a during event a couple of years ago, we provide these multi-panel plots. In the left corner, you can see the friction forecast, and we'll look at this more in some of the verification where you can see the three different friction forecasts, the one that assumes continuous treatment up top, the one that assumes no treatment in the bottom, and the, really the core forecast that reacts to these treatments with the up and downs. We also show a graphical display of the closure alerts, which is, is the same data that goes into the matrix. We show things like temperature, dew point, roti. These are all forecasts that go out to six hours. Snow accumulation, total snow in the blue line, snow rates. We also show things like the wind speed and direction, crosswind potential, which we developed for the airport, and on the lower right, um, blowing snow potential, which there wasn't for this case. Okay, next. And then ultimately, we, at the very end of the project, we created a web display that can just basically, it updates automatically and it provides all of the output products that we just discussed for all of the runways. Next. Okay, so really getting into the heart of the talk, this is where I wanted to spend the time was we're gonna now look at a bunch of cases and really see how the system did. This was the first time we really ran it without touching it <coughs> too much throughout the winter season. Although you'll see that I was able to make some fixes to the system by looking at the system and talking to Josh both in October and November, we identified a few issues and we were able to make some improvements. But I thought I would start with just some more common cases just to get an idea of you know, you know the system performance during the middle of the winter. So this first event was December 23rd. This, this particular event, it was a strong cold front where there was rain changing to snow, <coughs> excuse me. And then the, the temperature dropped from around 47 degrees to seven degrees. Precip started around midday on the 23rd um, and heavy snow came in with this event and MSP at the airport measured 8.8 .8 inches of snow. Our back end weather forecast showed about eight to 10 inches of snow. You know, we had noticed uh, during the beginning of the event, we had road T forecasts that were a little bit too warm, but you can see some of the plots from this 16Z forecast and um, starting to show some issues. Uh, next slide, please. So you can see here's the actual closure matrix um, that would have been visible to Josh and crew. And you can see at the beginning of this event, as it got started, you know, we were showing that runway closures were going to be possible. And then um, likely as the heavy snow came in towards the afternoon on the 23rd. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is really going get to get into the heart of the analysis. We use some uh, time series plots um, that was created by another engineer on the team. Um, and 
And we can compare really in a nice fashion, we can compare observations to, to forecast values. So the left, the y-axis is the friction values. The x-axis is the forecast lead time. So in this case, this is for one given forecast that goes out to six hours. So this was a forecast generated at 16Z, 10 a.m. Um, on the 23rd, it's for runway 12R30L, it's the center segment. The dark green points with the dark green line are the observations. Those were the exact observations as measured by MSP. We got um, Excel spreadsheets with all of this data and we were just connecting lines between the main points, which you can see. And then in the light green line, that's our main friction forecast that reacts to forecasted treatments. It was built based on historical treatment and observation data, but this model, so as you can see the event getting started, we actually get the trend right in the middle. We get the trend of a decrease in friction values all the way down to about 0.3. I circled the area there. The main thing initially was during the beginning of the event is our road temperatures within the model were a little bit warm. So we, we, we weren't showing friction values quite as low. You know, they measured friction down to about 0.25, which is certainly um, gonna have the runways closed, but we were close. And then next, right next to that, you can see that the system is reacting to a forecasted treatment now, the forecast of treatment is just off in time with the observed treatment because it's hard to line up the actual forecast treatments with, 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 with where MSP treats. But you can see that the, when there's a treatment in the forecast, the friction values react, they go up to about 0.5. And when MSP made their observation after treating the runway, you can see it got back up to about 0.5. And then the snow continued and we were predicting lower friction values through the event and there was closures. Next slide, please. So this is a very this is for the same forecast. It's similar output, but now what we can do is we can actually see the 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 light red line is your top boundary. That is basically a friction forecast that assumes continuous treatment. It's your upper boundary. The, the the darker blue line is the forecast that assumes no treatment whatsoever. It would be the lower bounds of what you would expect with no treatment. And of course, the light green is what I showed you before. So you can see that the, the, the two red lines sort of formulate a now nice bounding box where um, the forecast falls in between and the main forecast, which drives the closure matrix, is of course reacting to the treatments. And we can see some of the differences. It gets pretty close to the low values. Like I said, at the beginning of that, it was a little bit too warm. Next plot. Now, I only wanted to show one example of this type of plot before we move on to other cases. We have the ability to also look at the other segments. Remember, we're doing the center point, we're doing the northwest center, the northwest point, the center point, and the southeast segment a lot, typically on these runways. So this is just showing you for two different segments, which have different observations. So the observations are in the dark green and the dark purple. They're pretty similar. You know, obviously some of the runways, because of just different weather and physical characteristics, are going to have lower values. And then you can also see the forecast for the two different segments together. It's the, the, all three of the forecasts uh, for the two segments together, formulating the bounding box of what the expected values are. And you know, with the purple line compared to some of the, the brown lines, you can see we were a little bit too high initially on the front side of this event. That was mostly due to warm road temperatures. Okay, next. Okay, so moving on, let's now look at a more standard cold winter case. This was a case um, a few days later on December 29th. And this was your more of a classic moderate snow, cold snow event, midwinter. Precip started in the afternoon. MSP measured 2.4 inches of snow, but it was a cold event. The back end system that goes into RFCPS predicted about three to four inches. You can see on the graph, um, and we'll look at the closure matrix next. You can go on, next slide, please. You can see on the closure matrix here that since this was a colder event and we were already starting with cold road temps, that we were saying as the snow started, Runway closures were going to be likely and then really most likely on most runway segments as we got into the afternoon on the 29th and continuing into the 30th. Next slide, please. So this is a very similar plot that we showed before. So again, this is, you know, this is for one midpoint. Um, this is the southeast segment on 12L30R. It's for the forecast that was generated on December 29th at 19Z1 p.m. And you can see here on the graph, same thing. We have friction values on the y-axis. We have forecast lead time on the X. But as the event got started, we were close, once MSP started doing uh, runs because there was treatment necessary, we were actually quite close to the predicted friction values, especially these low points. And you can see where I circled 
Coincidentally, we had a treatment that was forecast basically at the same time that MSP treated the runway. Again, forecasted treatments and, and actual treatments don't line up in time. That would have been phase three. We're going to try to line those up. <clears throat> but we have a reaction of the friction model. It reacts up to some recovery. The, the, the recovery isn't quite as high as the observed value, which goes up to 0.5. But more importantly, when it keeps snowing, the runways still have low friction values as you move on. The, if you compare the observed to the forecast, we're really close showing values in the mid 20s, mu values of like 0.25. That's a really good. MSP is constantly treating. So you see re some recovery in their OBS. We weren't showing as much recovery because we didn't have a forecast treatment. But later on, we have a forecast treatment that actually matches the recovered friction values quite well. So this is just an example of the system performing pretty well, close to as expected during a winter storm. Next, please. And just uh, in the same sense as the other cases, I just wanted to show, you know, here's your bounding boxes in terms of friction values uh, that assume continuous treatment and friction uh, forecast that assumes no treatment. And it again, it, it bounds the friction values that were observed pretty well, other than the fact that, you know, we have lower values during recovery, but that's not as important because we were showing values above 0.4, even though the observation was say 0.55, we still wouldn't say any treatment there, it's still in the right range as far as recovery on the runway. Next. Next slide, okay. Um, and then really quickly, I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on this. We have other ways to look at the forecast verification in terms of looking at bulk statistics. And um, we can basically put in a date and time range and look over 24 hours and to look at every forecast generated. Remember, we're generating forecasts every hour and then it does some scoring. It tries to line up the forecast lead times with the observations. We do hit or miss percentages based on the critical range between 0.35 and you know 0.2. And so in this case, we had a hit percentage of 53%. We had a miss percentage of 46%. We had an MAE of about 0 0.156 in terms of the, the mu values. Next, please. Okay, so another uh, standard case, I'm gonna probably go through this one fairly quickly so we can get to the two interesting cases. This was a good one though um, for our system because it was a really cold midwinter event. January 23rd um, of this last year, 2021, uh, snow started in the afternoon on the 23rd, MSP measured 4.4 inches. We were really good with our snow forecast for this one right in the four to five inch range. Um, next slide, please. And in this case, because it was cold as the event started, you know, we were showing that runway closures would become likely um, pretty quickly after the event. They were possible initially, likely, and then the most likely on some of the segments as the weather really deteriorated and it got cold and it was snowy. Next slide. So pretty similar to that other case, so I won't spend a lot of time. Um, initially, we were just a little bit low with the friction values um, when the first run occurred. But as the, as the event got going from that 21Z forecast, again, I circled the area. We were really good with getting the low friction values. So, you know, the, the, the light blue line shows the, the main friction forecast. It's getting down to those low values quite close, you know, in the low 0.2 range, definitely closure type of friction values. We do have the reaction of the model to our forecasted treatments. That middle part, it's so our forecast does line up a little bit, um, but we don't have any more forecasted treatments until later. So again, the low values, it's getting those really well. It's showing some recovery. The recovered values, again, aren't quite as high, but in this case, we're still above the threshold for closures, so somewhat irrelevant with the high-end values. But I'm happy to see that the low values, saying that they're definitely going to be a problem in between treatments with the snow rates, um, did pretty well. Next, please. So um, again, this is just the bulk statistics. It was pretty similar showing a 54% hit rate and a 46% miss rate, rate with an MAE of 0.13. Okay, so <clears throat> getting, getting close to the end here, I don't wanna take up too much time, but um, basically this is, I'll show two really interesting cases. So this was an October 20th case. This was MSP's first really big fall snowstorm that went from rain to snow and it went to heavy snow. And so precip started around midday. MSP measured 7.9 inches of snow. We were really predicting about three to five inches of snow. And really the issue with this event and the November event was we had more rain than snow as our precip type. 
So it wasn't accumulating quickly enough. And also the road temperature forecast. This is pretty common with these models in the fall. The road temperature was too warm. Next slide. So with that in mind, we were only showing, even as the snow started to come in in reality, we were showing a little bit more rain with warm road temps. Eventually by 17, by 5 p.m. on the 20th, we were showing that runway closures would be possible, but not likely. And I know talking to Josh, they really did close the runways because it came in really heavy with like two inch per hour rates. Next slide, please. So I highlight this in this plot at the beginning where the beginning of this event, we were just too high with our friction forecast compared to the observations. You can see that in the first few hours. And like I said, it's because we had the precip type as rain and then the road temperatures were way too warm. So the system just didn't think there was gonna be an issue. The good thing is, is, this, is the forecast went on you can see that we were pretty, we were getting closer with the friction values. We knew there was be a, a problem. The system was predicting treatments, but with a much bigger recovery. And that's probably because of two warmer road temperatures, but our low values were, were, were close to the range. But because our road T was a little warm and we missed the precip switch over, we were a little light on the closure alerts compared to reality. Next. Next slide. Um, you can just go past this one. Next. Okay. And then do I'm I have sorry, to Seth. I think we have a lag going on here, so but bear with me on this. Okay. Do I have time to show this one? I have like five more minutes, or I can just jump to the conclusions if we're short on time. Um, yeah, it would be good to jump to the conclusions, Seth, if you would, please. Yeah. Absolutely. So move Thank forward. Thank you. Um, yeah, go forward. That. Okay. That last case really highlighted an issue that we were able to fix. So here's the conclusions. It's just the last two slides. So, you know, this was great to be able to look at this. And I really appreciate, you know, Josh and his support through the winter. You know, really the, the ML friction models are highly dependent on both having a good road T forecast and also a good precip type and snowfall forecast, as you would imagine. And as I mentioned here, after looking at the October event and the November event, we realized we had a, a bit of an issue with the precip type. I was able to change some configurations and that really helped sort of the switch over, catching the switch over from rain to snow. And then also we noticed that some of the OBS had dropped out for some of the ARWIS segments, the ARWIS that are at the airport. And so we weren't getting road T observations to forward air correct. I fixed an issue where we were doing some OBS sharing. And then as I said, you know, just in general, the road T forecast can be too warm during the fall. It's a heat balance model. So if it's been warm or there's high radiation, even with cloud cover, it can be too high and that can cause the friction values to be too high. And then the last slide really, next slide, please. Um, so ultimately though, what I was happy to see is that when the road T forecast is good, we've got the precip type and the switch over to snowfall and the snowfall forecast is close to reality. The system typically does really well with the snowfall fall forecast. The friction values are really quite good compared to reality. And even in the reaction with the treatments, so, you know, the last part that you saw, it's really hard to match the forecast treatments with actual treatments. So those up and downs may not match. We were going to work on that in phase three. And then ultimately, which doesn't as matter as much as our friction values when there is treatment are really typically not as high as the observations, not quite as much recovery, but they're usually in that range above 0.4. So it makes little difference because we show the recovery. And I think that's basically it. The last slide's just questions and we can go over that later. Thanks a ton, Seth. I appreciate that. And uh, we're going to go turn to Mike Robinson from MITRE right now. Mike, you ready? I'm ready, Tom. How are you doing? I'm doing great, thanks. I'm glad you're here, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. All right, Matt, I'm going to share my screen if that's okay. You got it. I was making last minute changes, so. <laughs> I'm shocked. <laughs> All right, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, hopefully you can see that okay. Let me just switch it around. Looks good, Mike. Oh, it does? Okay. Yeah. All right, first off, let me just give a quick uh, thank you to, to Matt and Matthias and all the session leads for pulling off another successful virtual FPAW. Uh, I haven't been able to join as much as I would have liked, but for what I've seen, it looks like it's been going uh, really, really well. So congrats, you guys. Uh, let me jump into this. So um, in the fall, I, uh, I gave a briefing along with um, Eric James and Gordy Rother, and collectively we talked about a couple of different things. 
starting with, you know, what is going on with the air traffic operations during the pandemic? So um, with my colleague, Wayne Cooper, who quickly pulled together an update on some of the, of the information, I have an update for that. And then we closed, if you recall, Matthias and I kind of ran uh, the back half of the session where we had kind of a, a table setting of, of topics of interest uh, in consideration of pandemic consequences that, you know, hit us a little bit closer uh, in our aviation weather community. So I'm going to close with kind of revisiting that list and those discussion points and, and kind of just reset a little bit after six months. Um, in many respects, a lot has changed, but in other respects, a lot has kind of stayed the same. So we'll get into that. Uh, so first, let me go through a few charts and uh, bear with me, folks. I'll try to uh, walk through those OK. Um, so last time when I briefed you, I was giving you statistics through about August, maybe a little bit of September, and now I'm going to carry them through into February and March. So first off, U.S. air traffic and the pandemic, what you're looking at here um, is the dedicated cargo, GA and passenger um, IFR operations in the U.S. Um, to and within CONUS and its destinations. Um, this is the latest week as a percent of the same week of last year. So what you see is, and as we know and have seen for a long time, cargo has kind of been clipping along, cargo operations, 90, 100, uh, 100 plus percent around the holidays. Uh, the GA, as you might have heard, has also kind of picked up and recovered quite quickly, uh, and they've been kind of marching along at 90 and over 100 percent at times also around the holidays. And you see the passenger flights have, have picked up from the floor, which was back in April and May. Um, we had high hopes for summer, but then we kind of hit our second surge. We had high hopes. Well, maybe not so high hopes. We, we all had in um, passengers had intents to travel during the holiday season. But that was also during our, our big surge. And you can see the passenger traffic uh, in terms of this US IFR operation statistic um, derived from TFMS has kind of leveled off at about 60%. And I'll talk about kind of where that's going. It's not the complete picture, though. Uh, this is a little bit more detail showing you a lot of the variability um, is airport and, and regional specific. Uh, you see a lot of the big hubs, particularly in the southern tier have really recovered well. You see Dallas, Atlanta, much of Florida as people really wanted to get out and get down there um, and, and some parts out in the in the uh, inter Intermountain West. And by by contrast, the Northeast has has continued to lag and, and hold back. And I think overall it's hard for me to see that number. Um, as of March 6 was when we would probably stop looking at those comparisons about in the bottom chart. Um, the air carrier flights arriving at U.S. major airports is about 59% of, of the previous period. Um, after that, we're starting to compare against a previous period that was also starting to be impacted by the pandemic. So what about the airspace utilization? I showed this last time as well. This is an update. This is for the week ending March 27th. This is the U.S. center operations across the, uh, the CONUS um, as in terms of average of the same weeks across three, three previous years. And again, what you see is uh, areas down around Florida, the southern part of the U.S., towards Texas, uh, and then up into the Intermountain West have, have improved pretty well. And, and down in Florida, you're down 80, 90 percent of your center operations compared to um, the previous years. And then the Northeast continues um, to lag up in Cleveland, New York, and Boston Center in particular. This is a new chart. I haven't shown you guys this last time. I call this my Darth Vader helmet chart. Uh, I didn't make it, but I named it. Uh, what you're looking at here is the max number of CONUS en route sector positions that are open by day, um, by the hour of the day. So the hour of the day is across the x-axis on the bottom. The peak is around, you know, 17, 18, up to 22Z. And if you start at the top, you'll see that um, this was around where before, uh, I think Bill Bauman said when, when the world stopped, or when the music died, uh, most of the CONUS en route sectors were open at about 600. Um, each operating hour and then I drop you down to the to the bottom of the helmet and this is when we were at the Nader in April and you can see we're down about 200 and then you can see the recovery here we are in periods in June and now we jump ahead now and here we are in periods of July it was a little bit higher during the holiday seasons um, it sprung back down but we're certainly on the road to recovery but we still have a ways to go this is a, a really ugly zoom, uh, and this is just to kind of again drive home that point that the, the Darth Vader helmet, um, those trends and traits are not universal uh, and homogeneous across the NAS. Other parts, just like you're seeing on the, on, the, on the center map on the left, 
are recovering much more quickly. Uh, Miami Center, it's the same type of traffic, but this is across months. This is like near current time now versus up in Cleveland Center, where again, much of that airspace is still not being demanded for and then not being necessarily open for capacity. I showed this last time in March as well. Again, let me just describe it a little bit. It's a really cool plot once you, <laughs> once you get the Rosetta Stone to see what you're looking at. This is the number of peak arrival periods by airport by week, um, taking a max per month. So what you're looking at are the airports on the left side, the, the, the individual months across the X axis. And these are the number of quarter hour periods per max week in that month where the actual arrival, arrivals were greater than 90% of the airport acceptance rate, or basically the call rate for capacity, uh, which measures um, peak periods. And what you see is um, coming out into uh, the pandemic period, you know, early on, where are we? Here it is. Uh, Pre-pandemic, you see you have many periods, many 15 minute periods per hour across these weeks where you have um, pretty heavy demand relative to capacity. And then you hit your um, the, the height of your pandemic and it dropped down to basically nothing. And then you can see the recovery. And you see some airports have really recovered, like um, Dallas, Fort Worth, and what Americans doing with their operation there. And in fact, in, in many respects, in, in, in current time now into March, they've actually exceeded um, some of their number of peak periods approaching uh, capacity. And other ones have picked up as well. And again, the, the other story, of course, is the other ones, that, there's other airports that have really not recovered much at all. Uh, Newark's the key one uh, where you see pre-pandemic, they had many periods uh, per week where they were operating uh, demand near capacity. And they've just now recently starting to get into double digits um, uh, in terms of re returning to that. So again, not all is equal. If you look at the uh, the top 20 U.S. airports average daily arrivals per week, this is uh, TFMS flown flights through um, early March. Again, you see the same type of story where airports like Atlanta, DFW are, are starting to really come back and get close to the, the pre-pandemic levels. Interesting, uh, I'm, I'm sure folks know what this dip is associated with in Dallas and probably Houston in February. That was the big polar plunge that caused all the disruptions in Texas during that period. Uh, and then, of course, you see some of the airports that are really starting to hold off, and the the, the biggest um, the biggest um, lagger remains the LaGuardia, which is still only operating at about twenty six percent of its pre pandemic um, um, arrival volume. Okay, this is my favorite chart. Um, this is what this is like when you look at a three D um, one of those three D pictures, and it looks like nothing until you actually can see it, and then it'll make total sense. So let me help you make total sense of it. This is actually showing the uh, how the, the 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 pandemic and the passenger sentiment is still driving um, travel demand and, and scheduling by the airlines. What you're seeing is a change in air carrier scheduling over time. Starting over on the left side, pre-pandemic, you're scheduling, you know, upwards of 26, 28,000 flights um, per day across all the carriers and operations. And then the pandemic hit, and the and the floor started to fall out of these schedules. Uh, and they kind of got their feet underneath them around May and started to schedule back up. And you see how these these periods um, are, are kind of equidistant early on. That's telling us that this, the schedule is relatively stable for about a month, maybe six weeks, sometimes eight weeks or so, where you're starting to get a better understanding of what passengers are going to show up for travel and what type of, of operation the, the air carriers wanted to operate. And then we got into that second surge and you see now we've got some some intermediate changes. We're making, we're making um, schedule changes in much shorter time, suggesting that there's a lot more uncertainty about what passengers wanted to do with respect to um, flying and then how much uh, of, that, of that fleet operation the air carriers wanted to operate and still um, mitigate their losses. I move over to the bottom chart now, and you still see some of that churn as we move into August, but then you see it went away. And this is during the, uh, the holiday volume, the, the holiday volume and travel season these schedule updates that were coming out in October and then into early November and expectation for travel through the new years, you kind of get those equidistant um, um, spaces again. A little bit more certainty in terms of these passengers really wanted to fly, they're booking, they're booking ahead, they're going to show up, the volume's returning, and we know everyone was traveling at that time of year, uh, and that was good. But you start to see here, this one, this is uh, a, the schedule update in late uh, September after the new year. 
And now you're starting to see it tip down and tip down and tip down. And that was the realization of our of our third surge, our big surge, which you see up here in the COVID data from the tracking project. And that uncertainty came back in. People weren't comfortable with traveling. Moreover, this was when the vaccine was announced and it was coming out. And since airlines have waived um, change fees, a lot of passengers were reaching in and saying, you know what, let me rebook for later when I'm going to have vaccines. I'm going to feel more comfortable about traveling. And that churn is still kind of happening. You see it's slowly starting to increase, but we're still, the schedules are still by and large more optimistic and then getting pulled back every every five or six weeks or so. So you can still you can still see that the operation is grappling with what's going to happen. And of course, the big question is this summer. Um, you know, is everyone really going to be traveling as much as, you know, earlier past summers? Uh, I'm not so sure. You know, anyone who's tried to rent a, a summer beach house on the East Coast within driving distance knows that they're all booked up. People are looking for things to, to kind of manage their risks still. So we'll have to see how this plays out. So this was a summary and takeaways on the aviation ecosystem. This is the same slide I showed in fall, but I want to talk about it in a little bit of a different light. So I talked about COVID's crushing impact, some recovery, then stagnation. We're still kind of stagnated a little bit. It's coming back and it really could roar back. All other parts of our society are just seem to be waiting on the cusp, right? But, you know, we're not going to get herd immunity in our country uh, anytime soon anyways. Um, and, you know, there's still a lot of uncertainty about how things are going to go with this pandemic. You know, ask India wh where they were three months ago versus now. Uh, the impact and recovery rates um, vary, uh, I would say not even some anymore, um, quite a bit regionally. Um, you no longer need to parse the data and squint to find congestion. It's there at certain airports. TMIs um, and constraints have returned to the system. Uh, and as weather returns to the system this summer, there is going to need there is going to be a return for weather impact mitigation and constraint management. Uh, COVID impact is still driving fleet schedule uncertainty, as I showed, even in the short term. Uh, I probably didn't need a bullet to say that the pandemic data is multidimensional and complex, but this is still making it very difficult to anticipate what's going to happen a few months, let alone six, 12 months from now still. Uh, and again, this is still very much a human impact. We still have folks, um, again, being infected with the virus, um, air traffic controllers, pilots, TSA agents and passengers, and we have to still see how this is going to play out. Um, the, this is the, the summary slide that Matthias and I used to kind of set up different discussions we touched upon. The pandemic co consequences closer to our aviation weather community. Uh, Eric James from uh, GSD and his uh, led, led a, a presentation from, from his, co his colleagues talk about NWP data assimilation uh, and the role of uh, aircraft based observations and, and how we're starting to see how the lack of aircraft last year um, really did um, uh, and can affect the quality of, of, of um, numerical weather predictions. Uh, and this is again opens up the door for other other opportunities and avenues to get more data. Uh, from different sources, be it satellite base, be it uh, UAS, um, those types of things. And of course, when the aircraft start flying again, we need those observations. Um, changing operation has a new constraint and focus. I'll talk about that again on my next slide, which is my final slide. Uh, weather research priorities and a new economic reality. Um, this was a slide from the fall. Uh, since we've added a $1.9 trillion um, uh, relief package on top of this, um, we'll have to see as, as um, investments kind of take hold in, in what are needed across the FAA, you know, as we know in our community, we seem to have to really fight and, 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 and really carve out and make our case for the, the, the true needs to be um, leaning forward in weather, weather research. And not only for the new operations and emerging operations, but for a conventional air transport operation, which has a lot of holes and gaps and needs still. Uh, we think there's climate forward opportunities, and this is probably even more so than we talked about this in the fall, given the change at the top in terms of our political leadership. We've already started to see that, and, and we've been seeing a lot of um, airlines really stepping forward and trying to make this a priority um, as their flying public wants to make it more of a priority and for other very good reasons. So that's an interesting area that deserves more attention. We've spent a lot of time as a, as a community and as a conference already talking about the increased um, small UAS opportunities not only in terms of the meteorological sense, but also as an as an operation itself. Um, I think there's a situation, for instance, I believe it was it was United who has purchased uh, 300 EV tall vehicles from Archer 
as they're already rethinking their operation that becomes a little bit more uh, multimodal. Uh, we talked last time about the increased ops integration. Uh, we often talk on our side and in, in our work, although um, um, Seth and Josh's talk showed a little bit more of an air side land side coupling, but we tend to focus on air side. But in terms of public health and moving through the system efficiently, there's reasons now to care more about being delayed, not just on the aircraft or in the air, but in the airport when you get dropped off at 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 at, at the uh, at the gate. Um, and and that, that, I'm not sure that's going to go away anytime soon. And we touched upon also the human impact of mid operations when we were in the thick of things last year. Um, you know, they have an operation that requires 24 seven um, support as well, and they have facilities that have to be managed in terms of infrastructure, human capital, um, human concerns and tragedy. And, and Gordy gave a, an interesting talk about some of the impacts in terms of um, weather reporting in Europe that required some some waivers for FedEx to operate because they were they were lacking some of the key observations they needed from a, from a human capital perspective. OK, um, really quick, I know I'm running long on time. Um, Again, in the fall, we talked about how the airlines were pulling back. Uh, United Express Jet was going to stop flying. The airlines were cutting flights to small cities. But this is changing a little bit now. Now we're hearing about, you know, airlines adding cities, you know, direct flights to Myrtle Beach, more flights to Nashville, to Austin. Uh, and again, these are not the same as flying to New York City or Washington, D.C., where there's more of a focus on the leisure travel um, population. And we still don't understand and, and know where the business travel population is going to um, is going to land at, on the other side of all this. So this whole passenger sentiment is still driving air traffic demand and maybe changing services, changing the operation and changing what we need to think about in terms of um, weather needs and priorities for that changing operation. And again, going back to the weather justification, I had that figure on the bottom. That was a swap event in New York City back in October. Very strong storms out a uh, um, departure um, gate on top of the Robbinsville arrival fix. Never in my life would I ever experienced. I th think you'd see that day in the middle of the afternoon. They had zero TMIs, um, but those days are going away now. And you know all of our past challenges and how to translate weather, um, um, manage and support a more efficient operation that doesn't sacrifice safety. Um, are we still going to be able to make that case that you know, hey, this needs to be needed given all else that was put on the shelf with respect to training, with respect to um, decision support capabilities, traffic flow management systems that were, are still slated to be deployed. There's a lot of folks feeding at the trough for R&D uh, and, and, and um, funding support. And, and where's weather going to sit in all this? And then lastly, again, I talked about the, uh, the climate focus from the airline, from the ANSP focus, and even again from political leadership, which I think is going to change a little bit and how we want to think about weather needs and opportunities to, to help the operation as it, again, starts to focus differently as we move forward in the future. We talked about the increased UAS opportunities. And then finally, the uh, the the, uh, the the more of a prioritization on public health that may drive back all the way into land side. And then finally, we touched on training. I think uh, Mark Fan have talked about this a little bit. There's a concern about, you know, all these pilots being brought back in um, as demand is going to surge and has already started to pick up. This is the same two, same thing with recurrent and um, training that's needed for air traffic controllers to get be brought up. We see this every April and May uh, during normal times where as swap season begins, everyone's a little bit slow and the impacts can be very severe because it's been six or eight months since we've seen convection. Now it's been six or eight months since we've seen demand, let alone you know convection. What is that going to do this summer if that demand really does surge? Uh, and we're still getting pilots trained up. We're getting air traffic controllers and traffic managers trained up. And we haven't seen this operation before. You know, my personal concern is, uh, you know, it's really hard to maintain that high level of excellence when, you know, it's you haven't seen that operation in a, in a little while now. And, and there's other things that you have to get wrestled to the ground before you can be as proficient again. So um, that's my last slide. That's a kind of a quick walk through and update on what we touched upon. And it's still an evolving and, and organic um, area. We don't really know what's going to happen, but there's certainly cracks and features in terms of our air aviation weather community that we have to pay close attention to. And I'll stop there, Tom. Thank you. Wow. wow. Wonderful, Mike. Lots of really, really good thoughts and questions. Thanks. Matt, how do you want to handle? There's a couple of questions in the chat room. Um. 
in the in the interest of trying to stay as close as we can to schedule, I'm going to suggest that uh, Tom that that we take this up after the fact and try to get back to the questioners as best we can, you know, by uh, alternate means at this point. You got it, boss. All right. Well, it's amazing how how stimulating and exhausting at the same time these can be. And by the way, uh, to try, I'm 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 coming to the conclusion that um, that that teaching all our presenters how to how to control, you know, how to share on Microsoft Teams and control their own slides is the way to go because uh, it, it it over many times today became a little bit more than at, than, than I seemingly could handle. But whatever, we'll, we'll muddle on through. Um, in, in any event. Um, Great, great day from Steve Dar and uh, and and what an what an interesting leading edge uh, topic Steve and his group covered both from the 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 integration of ADSB weather type information into our systems and 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 Steve honed right in on you know we we've got this part figured out and next we got to work on this part and. And without it, we're going to have a whole bunch of really good data just falling in the bit bucket if we don't if we don't do something here pretty soon. So, I absolutely need to get going in there. And then the afternoon portion of the session with the the, the kind of the, the low altitude um, weather uh, needs and and certify providers versus I mean certify instruments versus certify um, uh, data and and the incorporation of risk into that whole model. Silver standard, gold standard, bronze standard, paper standard, uh, just 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 fascinating topics. And and then uh, Tom, thanks for uh, for your three uh, swings through our recent presentations and updates uh, from from Bill, from Josh and Seth and from Mike. Thank you guys all wonderful stuff. I'm going to need to take a breath and 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 think about some of this a little while and also get ready for tomorrow. And uh, Matthias, tomorrow, what do we have? We have Li Jang with a, a session on estimation oh, right. of capacity, right? Right. And that ties ni nicely into what Mike was talking at the end in terms of how we may go back up with demand and, and the summer and the storm impacts. Are we even ready for that? I don't know to what extent that they will touch base on this, but I think they will touch base on in general about the the convective storm impacts and how it's being handled and where the opportunities are. So that should be an interesting uh, discussion with a lot of uh, panelists from a variety of, of angles looking at this. Yep. And then if you stick around long enough at the end of the day, uh, Matt and I will talk a little bit about FPA updates and uh, where we see things may be going. Yes. Uh, and and uh, maybe a a a way um, a, 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 an option uh, to um, well and a going forward option and I guess I'll just leave it right there and and if those, any of you who have been lurking on the fpod.ero website will have already seen it but we'll try to fill in a little bit of a little bit of the blanks that might exist there but. Um, I don't think I have anything else, Matthias. How about you? No, I think we should try to not drag it out any further because we have one more day tomorrow to go. So we just invite you back for another day of stimulating presentations and discussions. So thank you for a good day. Very well said. Goodbye, all. <laughs>